gentlemen. Please welcome New York Times food reporter Julia Moskin and panelists Trevor Hooper, Frank Stitt, and Danny Meyer. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm a reporter in the food department. I am not an uh, urban development expert, but obviously I grew up in New York and restaurants are our public spaces. You know, people don't entertain at home. We don't have garden parties and backyards and country clubs. And so restaurants are really a special thing for New Yorkers. But each of you have made a tremendously successful restaurant empire not to put it too grandly, in your cities. So Trevitt, Pittsburgh, Frank, Birmingham, Danny, right here in New York. So, and in all of the empire building that you've done, there has been an element of transformation of your cities. So I hope we can dig into how that works, even if it wasn't exactly what you set out to do. Um, before we get to that, though, because I always like to talk about food, um, you have so many restaurants, you've served so many meals. Is there one dish or one ingredient that you think has contributed the most to your success? Let's just do a lightning round. I would have to say uh, roast chicken. Um, <laughs> it's, you know, being a chef, I always want to do funner, more interesting things, but my customers let me know that they're there for the chicken often. And <laughs> so. And is there something special about your chicken? Um, I just think doing it, uh, we do it, we've done it many times. We've, we've gotten really good at it. Mm -hmm. We can consistently make it really good, so. All right, well, people, yeah. And that's the thing, if you try to take it off the menu, mm -hmm. people are. Like, we've, had, we've had tables walk out. <gasps> yes. So that's when we started putting it on more regularly. <laughs> <laughs> I, I can imagine. And what about you, Frank? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> well, I was talking with uh, Dennis Leonard uh, bef before coming up here uh, about this conference, and he was saying, well, well Frank Highlands... Is Sorry, who is, who's Dennis Leonard? He's a friend who was uh, a, a, just a, a regular that hangs out at our, our bar. Oh, okay. um, <laughs> You're not supposed to know. But he said, <laughs> <it's okay. laughs> Highlands is the house that Grits built. Uh, so there is a Grits you know, dish that we do that's like a souffle with wild mushrooms and country ham and sherry vinegar and white wine and parmesan and fresh thyme that uh, is... Uh, so that sounds totally representative of your roots in Alabama and your training at Chez Panisse and your life in France. Well, exactly. I mean, it's, you know, 30 years ago, grits were pretty terrible. They were instant. They were far from being a, a, a really great ingredient. But, you know, I had to go to a health food store to find uh, organic, you know, stone ground grits. And so this one does weave in this uh, sophisticated country, rural, urban uh, mix of things that, I, you know, that I'm uh, still attracted to. Mm, perfect. And you? Um, I've got to answer this three different ways if I can. The first third of my career, it was tuna without any question. 25% of Union Square Cafe's sales were connected to tuna. The filet mignon of tuna, which then led to the tuna burger and the tuna salad sandwich. Second part of my career was pork between Blue Smoke and the Big Apple Barbecue Block Party and Maialino. And I guess the latter part of my career, I have to say crinkle cut fries. <laughs> I kind of want to talk about the fries. <laughs> why is it, why, what's the problem? Why has it been so hard to get your fries in there, Well, actually, there's no problem. So, the, well, maybe, the, prob the problem right, was a little history. So no, the crinkle cut fries were Crinkle cut fries with are the, kind of what I grew up with in St. Louis, and that's what I wanted to have at Shake Shack. And then we said to ourselves, stand for something good means, well, you better do fresh as opposed to frozen, because yeah, fresh is always better than frozen. But we learned from our regulars that they loved our fries the way they were, and that fresh is actually not better than frozen when it comes to French fries because potatoes, like any other fresh vegetable, have a season. And if you try to use fresh potatoes throughout the whole year, you, you, you know that apples that were picked in September, October don't taste particularly great in April, May, June, July. The sugar content changes, the starch content changes, and so we couldn't get them right uh, in a consistent way as fresh 
They got their crinkle cut fries back. They're very happy. It was just very interesting for those of us who follow the restaurant scene in New York because Danny Meyer has made a very few public stumbles in his career. There has been. I not, hope that's the worst one we ever make. There have not been too many, you know, new Coke kind of fiascos. But when you tried to do the the fresh fries, there was outcry. So the frozen crinkle cuts, that's now and forever? Uh, I believe, I, you know, forever is a long time. Well, but uh, cool. we did get a gift because when we opened Shake Shack in London, um, as, you, as you know, GMOs and chemicals are prohibited in any of the food there. And so we, uh, we were forced to find a way to do crinkle cut fries without GMOs and without chemicals. And it turned out that the ones we found were better than the ones we had originally had in the States. So when we scrapped the fresh fries and brought our London non-GMO, non-chemical crinkle cuts back here, it actually <laughs> helped us to improve the product. Yay. Cool. Um, OK, so getting back to the cities. So when you open Highlands in Five Points in Birmingham, um, it was not exactly a, a, neither an urban wasteland or a culinary wasteland, but what was the fine dining scene like? Mm. Well, there, I mean, there really wasn't that much going on for fine dining. There was, um, there, there were the country clubs where people over the mountain, Mountain Brook, would go and have their events, and that was their club. And there were some Greek restaurants downtown that were seafood <laughs> restaurants. There were that were actually did did well, and some still are there. But um, and there were a few kind of not particularly great quality French restaurants. Um, and so it was ripe for someone doing something that was special, that was really good. And um, I first worked at a Hyatt. It was one of those at the top of the building downtown. Did it, did it go around and it, around? No, this one didn't go around. <laughs> the one in Atlanta did. This Birmingham got the, 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 the one that didn't. But uh, in fact, a lot of those people, some of those people are still working with me, that we were at this Hyatt. And then uh, I decided to open this restaurant in this neighborhood that was had uh, little bombers. It was a biker club uh, bar. It was a uh, rough area. Uh, but it was a it was a architecturally really interesting. Pretty much everything was built in the 20s, and um, there it was proximity was too close to UAB, which is uh, was an up and coming university, and between downtown and over the mountain, so people would have to naturally go by where we were on their way back home. So there was a little bit of city involvement that had uh, helped with some urban renewal. And a local artist built this wonderful fountain at Five Point South. And so that became this kind of an art uh, attraction that people would come to. And at the same time, when I opened Highlands, uh, the, some of the, the little seedy, rougher areas were, I mean, they still, they're still somewhat there. But it is a very diverse, young, old, uh, black, white mix of a, of a neighborhood that I'm still very attracted to and I lo love very much. Mm. So, um, how and did you envision? Who did you envision the customers being? Well, you know, and, and and how did that influence how you designed the menu? I mean, at that time, Southern food was not prestigious, mm. at least on the global stage, mm. and it certainly, as you you know, like. In every city, French cuisine and maybe some northern Italian restaurants were, you know, where you would take a client or go for your anniversary. Right. So how did you design the menu, and who did you envision would be eating it? Well, having spent time at Chez Panisse and working with Richard Olney in France and, and then coming back home to the south, I really wanted to weave in my love of French country cooking with our southern ingredients. And so that's how Highland's food evolved. But I was very influenced by Tadish Grill and by Galatois in New Orleans, as well as Chez Panisse. But, but um, it was um, the, the people that I, I, I wanted to get were the people that were the doctors and the lawyers, the workers. There was an oyster bar, and there was a real 
an attempt to not have it a fancy, I think that's why I called it bar and grill, to, to try to make it a more casual uh, feel, but with the best in service and the best in ingredients and best in food. Sort of like Union Square Cafe, in fact. Um, so Trevitt, uh, let's talk about how you ended up opening a modern fine dining restaurant in Pittsburgh. How did that happen? Well, um, your neighborhood was hardly uh, an urban wasteland no, of any no. kind, but it was a bit of a culinary wasteland. Yeah, in you know, I think in one thing that's interesting about Pittsburgh, you know, we didn't have much of a eating out culture. I mean, people with money they ate in the clubs, and 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 that was really prevalent. And and so in the in the 90s, they're really wasn't much there, and, and, and it was starting. Um, and then I, I worked there in you know, the late 90s. I, I moved there. Uh, my wife is from there, so that's how I got introduced to the city. So you married into Pittsburgh. Married into Pittsburgh, okay. and we both loved it. Um, but I, 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 I had the, a taste of cooking in some other cities, and I, I kind of realized I wasn't going to get good training there. So um, we moved to California for five years came back and um, we, we knew we wanted to live, the, the livability of the city is, is really amazing. Um, and so, and we knew we could get open. I mean, we got open, we, we opened our first restaurant for under $100,000, mm -hmm. which is not much money no. uh, to open a restaurant. Was the, were there any subsidies or city programs that you were nope. able to take advantage of? No, it was just there. It just there and we had mm -hmm. a willing landlord um, and it was just kind of a, a perfect storm of things that happened. But were you able to, I mean, a, a restaurant like yours relies on a very complex regional network, yes. right? Because you do a great deal of local sourcing. So how uh, did that, did that exist by the time you came back? Did you help create it? What was the? Well, it, it was starting. Uh, there's this organization called Penn's Corner Farm Alliance, which is a cooperative of farms, and they were delivering to uh, restaurants. Uh, for, they, were, they were around for about five years when we opened, and, um, but still, there, there's still a lot of gaps, and I think for us, it was a matter of building the infrastructure within our restaurant to be able to take you know, whole sides of beef and to be able to uh, make room and time to preserve vegetables that we could eat in the winter. So it's really a matter of um, changing, changing how we do things um, internally. And, and now it's actually become a much more easier to, to source things. And right, now you have a network of mm -hmm. uh, mushroom foragers and all sorts and of more direct. I mean, you, I imagine you couldn't get, it was very difficult to get foie gras in Pittsburgh and other pres those prestige ingredients that Foie gras wasn't so hard, but I think the seafood and produce and, and, and you know, healthy meat that's not commodity meat, th those are the, have always been challenges. Mm -hmm. And then your story is, is very famous, that you opened a, you know, Union Square Cafe in Needle Park, practically. It was a neighborhood where when I grew up, you would uh, walk through with your keys sticking out um, between your fingers. A police officer came to our classroom in sixth grade and told us that was how we should, uh, how we should conduct ourselves in, in iffy neighborhoods. Um, That's hospitality. <laughs> <laughs> um, how did you decide which of the many sketchy neighborhoods in New York to open then, and how did it proceed? Well, it was a sketchy neighborhood. The first. The first month that Union Square Cafe opened in 1985, invariably when I would come to work on a Saturday morning, um, I would walk over the chalk outline on the sidewalk of someone who had been <laughs> shot the night before at the underground. Um, and by the way, we have all these shootings today, but this was, this was happening almost on a weekly basis. Now it's a Petco um, on Union Square Park. But I, I have to say that it was the green market that, that made me say, this is where we need to open. I had um, fantasized about being one of these guys. I wanted to be a chef, but I, was, um, I knew I didn't have what it took to go deeply into cooking. Um, so I didn't end up being a chef, but I had lived with a chef in Bordeaux and also worked with um, chefs in Italy before opening Union Square Cafe. 
And we just went to the market every morning. It wasn't a badge of honor, it's how you did business. And when I, I didn't even know about the Union Square Green Market. I had been living uptown all those years. <laughs> and back then it was only two days a week. It was um, every Wednesday and every Saturday. They didn't add Monday and Friday till later. But when I saw that there was this amazing farmer's market right in my own city, I said, that's where I want to put a restaurant. And it was $8 a square foot, the, uh, the rent that we took over at Union Square Cafe, which had been a 49-year-old vegetarian restaurant called Brownies. And um, it, I had heard from somebody that the advertising industry and publishing industry were soon going to be moving into this neighborhood to escape raising rents in Midtown. Midtown. Mm -hmm. And I said, let's take a, you know, let's take a risk on this. I said to myself, let's take a risk on this. <laughs> and Self, I said. And we did. <laughs> and uh, of course, the, the rent that forced us out of there 30 years later was over $350 a square foot. Mm -hmm. And so we were very, very fortunate to find a space uh, just a few blocks away. So we'll continue to use the green market when Union Square Cafe the second reopens. But you haven't really continued to open restaurants in underserved neighborhoods. And, and the new Union Square Cafe is going to be on, you know, practically restaurant row. Um, Did you say we have not? I'm sort of asking. No, I, I completely disagree with that because mm -hmm. um, I, I think the lesson that, that I learned was that when you're opening a, a restaurant, and I think most of you probably understand this, but restaurants work on pretty thin margins to begin with. And your rent and your labor and your food costs are the, big, the biggies. The rent is something that's fixed for the term of your lease. So you better get that right. And so I think it pays restaurants to be on the edge of, of where they think tomorrow's neighborhoods are going to be because we're fortunate to be in a business where people are willing to go anywhere for a new restaurant experience, unlike you know, opening a jewelry shop where you've got to be on you know, the right street corner. Um, and you, by the way, you could order that piece of jewelry online if you wanted to. With a restaurant, you got to go there. And people actually like the transporting experience of going to somewhere. And they're willing to do it uh, for a restaurant that's on the tip of people's tongue. So if you can lock in a lower rent in a neighborhood that you're willing to make a bet on, and people come, and because they come, then if you're lucky, you start to get competitors. It took me a long time to feel great about getting competitors around Union Square. but the more that happens, the better. Then you're, you're left with a situation where for the next 20 years, your rent is lower than everybody else's. And so instead of paying your landlord extra money, you get to hire better cooks and managers and sommeliers. And you end up having a better value proposition for your guests over time. So we've done that time and time again. People don't remember, but before Gramercy Tavern went to 20th Street, there was nothing around there. So even that was a gamble. Madison Square Park, people don't remember, but before 11 Madison Park and Tabla and certainly Shake Shack were there, that was a completely forgettable park. North End Grill um, at the north end of Battery Park City, no one was going there. Mm -hmm. And now you're starting to see an electromagnet because we have tons of competitors, and so you get critical mass. So this is a So are you going to go to Bushwick next? <clears throat> I think someone got there before we did, but what, what I would say, called Roberta's, in case anyone's a great place, but um, look for where the coffee goes. Coffee is almost always first. And the reason for that is that um, in an up and coming neighborhood, um, first of all, everyone drinks coffee. People who don't even have money spend too much money on coffee. And it doesn't cost that much money to open a coffee place because no one ever judges it based on the decor, as a matter of fact, the less decor, the better. But if you look where the coffee goes, you can almost bet on that neighborhood. It used to be, in the old days, art galleries, and before that, prostitutes. Now it's coffee. <laughs> and in fact, in New York, some you know, upscale coffee shops have been graffitied um, as in protest against gentrification, which is a much dirtier word now in New York City than it was in 1984. Um, is that something that was an issue for you, Frank, gentrification of the neighborhood? Or is that 
are there enough neighborhoods in Birmingham that really need the boost and in that you're not displacing longtime residents because mm. that's become a big issue, of course, in New York real estate. We're so limited in our space. Yeah, I, th I think Birmingham is, is different that way. Birmingham is very, uh, this neighborhood that Highland Avenue goes on and there are parks uh, and is, has always been an, an area where there are a lot of the young people will have apartments and then that, now there are some condominiums that are nicer, and but it's not a uh, there's 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 room. And what's been exciting though is that in downtown, just ten blocks away, it has been a total turnaround in the last uh, five to eight years. In what used to be a, an area that nobody went, now there are a number of my former uh, staff members, <laughs> uh, chefs, and 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 uh, other other employees have opened up really vibrant, exciting restaurants. And, you know, I'm, I'm like Danny on thinking, you know, maybe at first you're a little concerned about that competition, but it has made Birmingham a really much more vibrant and exciting place. And so there's great Southeast Asian food and Mexican food and, and really fun, exciting bars. And so, you know, I feel as though Birmingham as a community is a, is a great place to uh, to, to visit, to live, and it's, it's easy to get around. So we don't have anything like the pressures that you do on that kind of gentrification. However, there is one area, Avondale, that now there are uh, really cool coffee uh, shops and bars and music venues and retail, and that it has put a little pressure on some of the people that were living there that was pretty much a an area for, for crack, for, for drugs and crime. And so that area is, a, is, is going through, you know, a, a little bit of a, a tough time and some of the local people are not so embracing that so much. But in general, what may be a little bit strange to hear is that Birmingham, I think, is a much more kind of racially uh, comfortable uh, urban area than a lot of other cities. So. It's certainly, uh, I mean, having, having been to Highlands, it, it's, it's very rare still in New York City to see a very ethnically mixed crowd in a restaurant. And certainly in Atlanta and in, in Birmingham and places where there is a larger black middle class, right. that is uh, something that's so striking when you spend so much of your life in, in New York where that's really not the case. Let, let me jump in with a question from, that's been emailed um, to us. It, and I think that this gets to the question of the municipalities. Because I've talked about the role of food in the city, in the restaurants that you've built. What, what role has municipal government played in helping make your restaurants a success? What, what do you feel like you owe to New York or to Pittsburgh or to Birmingham? And, and, and what do, does the city owe to you? And how do you, how do you take advantage of that or make good on it? Do you want all of them to answer? Yeah, well, I'll, start with Danny. all right. I'll be I'll be glad to start. Well, I, I think in New York City, the bid system has been fantastic. The business improvement district, and I served on the Union Square uh, bid board, uh, 14th Street Business Improvement District, uh, for many many years. Also, we have a bid in Madison Square Park. There's fantastic uh, organizations down in Battery Park City as well. And what they've done is to be a quasi-governmental, quasi-private bridge so that you can actually have businesses speaking to government and, and vice versa. Um, no question that Shake Shack would not exist had it not been for the Parks Department of New York City saying, we agree that if you're willing to donate philanthropically this building to the park so the park becomes its landlord, this was never supposed to be a chain. It was supposed to be a way to attract people to a park to keep the park safe and to raise revenue th for the park. It took New York City to be enlightened enough to say, if you guys are willing to donate that kiosk so the park becomes the landlord, you can have the business. And today, um, Shake Shack raises well over $700,000 a year for Madison Square Park. So every time you buy crinkle cut fries there, you are actually contributing to the park and people are using it and keeping the park safer. That never could have happened without the city. Another example is, um, it's another uh, Shake Shack example. When Shake Shack went to downtown Brooklyn on a corner that the city said, we are trying to transform Fulton, uh, Fulton Street into something that feels safe. Um, 
between the, the corridor all the way to Flatbush Avenue, and Shake, we see Shake Shack as being the, you know, sort of the, the mouth of the Panama Canal to take you there. We, the city, are going to build a small uh, outdoor park outside of it so that people can feel safe eating outside, congregating outside, not just for Shake Shack, but that then attracted Hill Country, another restaurant, and, it, and then that attracted two more restaurants in the area. And so what, what happens is, I think restaurants can often stack the logs on the fire, but the city is the lighter fluid that can really make it, it happen in a big, big way if they choose to do it. That's please go, yeah, please. You, you know, with, with me and uh, say, to say the mayor and over the last few decades, Often we have a really good friendship and relationship. The mayor will hang out at our restaurants, and so he's kind of a he's a he's a regular there, and so that's been true for for a number of mayors, and so we have a I think a, a good relationship. There's the city council is pretty dysfunctional, and I wish we had a metro government more like Nashville, but um, but you know there was there was one little thing that I I got involved with that was. Uh, a little bit of a, a squabble with a, uh, a Chick-fil-A wanted to put a drive-through right next to us, which to me is not a real urban uh, good choice, a good design. And so, you know, I was spoke my piece about, you know, this is not, there are people walking here, young, old, handicapped people, and you want to put this drive-through here. I just don't think it's a really great fit for an urban area. And so, you know, the, the planning board, you know, listened to that and, and they chose to go with that. So I, I feel as though that even though there was some pushback on that, I, I felt as though that that was us working together to, to try to make this urban area, you know, what, what it is where people can walk and come. And because it's food, setting the table brings people together. And I think that that, um, you know, we need to try to be able to, to work with the city government so that you know, we're all, uh, you know, when, 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 when people are coming into the city. So I think we'll open it up to questions from all of you. Should we bring up the house lights? Well, I can see you, so you get to ask the first question. Uh, can you use the mic so everyone can What do can you hear? do with the uh, food that you don't use? Well, I'm going to jump in here because one of my questions was about food waste um, and obesity and all of the tremendous issues that are connected to restaurants and food. And the question of how much you know, restaurateurs and chefs can be responsible for these vast issues. You know, that um, when I asked the chef Thomas Keller this question, he said, you know, this really shouldn't be my problem. Um, and I quoted him saying that, and he has not spoken to me since. But what he was saying was that these are vast matters that should be addressed by, you know, federal governments and um, the UN and not really by individual chefs and restaurants. So I know that you, Trevitt, have had trouble. You have really tried to be um, a fully farm-to-table, nose-to-tail restaurant, so no waste of meat. Um, but that's I provided, created some challenges for your customers. Oh, sure, yeah. Um, you know, people like familiarity. They like getting this, you know, same things when they come in. So th there's a challenge there. Um, I think as far as food waste goes, you know, we, we don't have a lot. Um, we, we, we have a staff meal every day where we, we basically eat the leftovers. Um, and so the, there's very little that actually goes to waste there. Right, you do a lot of um, fermenting, mm -hmm. preserving. Yeah, so if something's, you know, not as wonderful as we want it to be, we can ferment it, we can, you know, eat it two or three months later in winter and make a soup out of it. So there's but do you, I mean, and are your customers like, yay, pickled I, fiddlehead ferns? I think so. <laughs> Again. Yeah. Uh, I <laughs> because think so. people want what they want to a certain extent. It's true. I mean, there's always a balance between what you want to do and because people sh certainly should get what they want. But at the same time, you know, we're chefs. We know a lot about food and we might know some things that they might not know they wanted. And, and so 
striking the balance between those two things, I think is really an art, the art of running a restaurant. It is, and I'm so sorry, but on that note, we are out of time, so we'll have to wind it up. But thank you so much for coming. Thank you so much to our panelists. This is a great talk. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.